In this video, we take a look at the Cambridge Computer Science Pseudocode Guide AS Level. This is part two of two. If you missed part one, make sure you head back over and check out that video. All right, let's dive in. So selection statements, there are two types. These are gonna be your if statements and your case statements. So let's start with if statements. It uses the keyword if, the keyword then, and the keyword end if, and yes, this is supposed to be one word, there is no space. Now it may or may not include an else keyword. It depends on the if statement that you have to construct for the given problem. So let's take a look at the syntax. We're gonna start with the keyword if, all caps. We kick to a new line, we write our condition. We then go to a new line, we write the word then. Then we go to a new line, we write our statement. Then we go to a new line and we write our end if. This takes up a ridiculous amount of space. I don't like that they have it formatted this way, but it doesn't matter. They're not asking us, they're telling us. So um, if you run out of room on your paper two exam, simply raise your hand and ask whoever your examiner is to give you an additional sheet of paper so you continue writing uh, your code. Let's take a look at an example. How could we use this format to write real pseudocode if player turn equals one, then player turn equals two, and if. Now notice my if matches uh, in the same uh, indentation as my end if, my then is indented, and everything else is indented, and it's to make it easy to read. So let's take a look at if else statements. So we have our if statement, followed by our condition, followed by our then, followed by our statement. All of that is the same, but if that condition isn't met, then we use else, which is indented along with then. We indent again, we put our statement, we close our end if, matching that, where that original if statement is. Here's an example. If player turn equals one, then player turn equals two, else player turn equals one, and I close it with the end if. And this uh, code I got from the tic-tac-toe video that we made. So if you wanna learn how to make tic-tac-toe, make sure you check out that video. All right, nested if statements. You continue with the indentations every time an if statement appears inside another if statement. And this makes it easier to read and for your examiner to have a clear understanding of what your code is actually doing. So here's an example. If current score is greater than previous score, then if current score is greater than high score. So if my current score is greater than my previous score, then I'm gonna follow this if statement. And if current score is greater than the high score, then we're gonna output, you have the highest score of all time. If not, I'm gonna say, you know what? You beat your previous score. If this isn't true, then I'm gonna put my else, uh, I'm gonna close my end if, then I'm gonna put my else. Notice my else matches up close where my then is. Then I output, you did not beat your previous score, and I simply end if. With all this indented, it makes it very easy to read. So yes, it takes up a lot of space, but it makes it very easy for your examiner to read. All right, case statements. This is your second type of selection statements. Now these allow for several branches of code to be executed depending on the case. It uses the keyword case. Now it may or may not include the keyword otherwise. It depends on what you need to write for the given problem. So let's take a look at the syntax. We have case of followed by the identifier, the variable that we are checking. Then we have value one, value two, followed by some code that will happen. Now, if we want to have something happen if value one and value two aren't selected, then we can have otherwise followed by another uh, statement of code. We close it with in case, and yes, that is one word that is appropriate. That's how you do it. So here's a real example, case of username. We're checking to see a username that somebody has entered. If they've entered Ada, we're gonna output the statement correct. If they input John, then we're gonna output accessing records. And notice, after you have your value, you have a colon. That is the action or the statement of code to be carried out. Now, otherwise, if they don't enter Ada or John, we output incorrect, and I close it all together with end case. So you can also use a range of values if you want. So you can select a range. Uh, here's an example. So let's say we have to figure out, are they able to gamble? Well, case of age. Well, I'm not gonna do if they're zero, if, you know, age zero, age one, age two, age three, all the way to 17, I can simply use a case statement to do that, case of age. 0 to 17, I put my colon. What am I gonna do if they're 0 to 17? I'm gonna output cannot gamble. If they're 18 to 100, I'm gonna output make your wager, and then I'm gonna end my case. Now, 
iterations. An iteration is a loop. That's all it is. And there are three loops or iterations you should be familiar with. The count controlled loop, which is a for loop, a preconditional loop, and a post conditional loop. If you need help in VB writing code for these, we have a video on these three loops as well. So the for loop. The for loop is a count controlled loop. You should use next to close the count controlled loop. Here's the syntax. We have for, the identifier, then where it's gonna start, how far it's gonna to go to, and then how much it's gonna increment each time it runs. We have our code that runs, we have our next, identifier and this identifier matches the one we started the for loop with this step increment is not necessary if you leave this off they're going to assume that it's going to run just like regular program code meaning each time it runs it's going to increment by one if you need to increment uh, to another number besides one you must use step because it's a keyword it must be all caps and you have to put your increment let's take a look at an example here for index equals one to ten step one now did i need to put step one there no i did not i'm just showing you what you can do student names index and i'm simply initializing the values of each of these uh, strings in the array and then next index notice i'm closing my for loop which for loop? The one that says for index. This next index says, hey, the for loop you're closing is the for index loop. Now, nested for loops, and this is where the next index comes into play. Uh, nested for loops are generally used for 2D arrays. We have a treasure hunting game written in Java and VB that uses 2D arrays. So if you need help with those, you can head over and check uh, those videos as well. For row equals one to 10. I output a question mark. Then for column equals one to 10, I output a question mark. If I use next, it may be a little tricky to know which for loop I'm closing. Because I use next column, it makes it very clear to the examiner and others that I know, hey, I'm closing this inner loop. It's now time to close the outer loop. So I close it with next row. All right, your post condition loop, uh, these use the keyword repeat and the keyword until. The code's gonna run at least once and then the condition is checked after the code is executed. So we repeat, we have our code, it keeps doing it until the condition equals true. So here's an example. We repeat the following code. We input a password. We keep having them input a password until the password equals Rufus, which will then allow us to exit the loop. Preconditional loop. Now these use the keyword while and the keyword in while, and yes, in while is one word that is correct. Code may not run at all. The condition is checked before the code is actually executed. So we have while, we check our condition. If the condition is met, we put our statement, we in the while. Here's an example. While number is less than or equal to zero, we're just gonna keep telling them, pick a number larger than zero, and then we're gonna close our loop. Really what we should have here is output, pick a number larger than zero, input number, then close our loop. Otherwise, this is gonna keep outputting forever until the, until the program crashes, when it runs out of memory. Okay, procedures. Procedures are your subs or your methods that do not return a value. Now the procedure may or may not have parameters. It depends on the question being asked. Now, to call a procedure, use the keyword call. You call procedure and then you call it by name. So you call procedure, keywords, all caps, and then the procedure name. Very, very simple there. Now, here's the syntax with parameters. We use procedure in all caps, we give it a name, then we have parameters and we have a data type. So in this one, we have two parameters. Parameter one has a data type, parameter two has a data type. This is just like declaring variables, except for inside, you're not using the word declare. We have some code that runs. Those are our statements in procedure. And again, in procedure should all be one word that is correct. Here's an example of, or syntax without parameters. Then we'll get to our examples. We have procedure identifier, but this time no parameters. We have our code execute in procedure. Let's take a look at some examples of these with and without parameters. So this one's with parameters. Procedure addition num is going to be the data type integer. Answer is going to be assigned the value of num plus four in procedure. Without parameters, I can do procedure 
ask name, and I spelled procedure wrong both times. It says proctor. Should be an E in there, so you definitely want to spell it uh, correctly. Um, I'll put enter your name, input the name, and then we end the procedure. So make sure that uh, you end the procedure, and make sure you give your procedure a name, and find out whether or not it needs uh, parameters or not. All right, your functions. Functions are different from procedures because they actually return a value. Let's take a look at the syntax. We have function followed by the function name. It has, param it, it has parameters just like procedures do. This time it has one thing extra and that is the keyword returns. And you're gonna put the data type that is being returned. We have our statement and then we have our end function. Here's an example. Function get fine. We're passing down speed as an integer. We're gonna return the data type real because most likely we're gonna get a decimal. We're gonna return the value of speed times 1.15. We end our function and with that, we're good to go. So file handling, getting to the last part. When using a text file, you can open three modes. You can open it to read, you can open it to write, and you can open it to a pen. Now when you're reading, you're just reading data from a file, you're not adding anything. When you wanna open it to write, you're writing new data that's gonna overwrite the pre-existing contents. So if you have a file with tons of information in it and you open it for write, all the information is gonna be gone. If you wanna to add to the existing information, you're gonna use the keyword append. You add new data to an existing file, you keep the previous data. So the first thing you have to do is you gotta open the file. So we open our file, the file name, for, and then we pick one of the modes why we want to open it. So here's an example. We open the file gamesave.txt for read. That's one option. Another thing is I can open a different file, say open file new gamesave.txt for write. Now when I open it for write, it's going to create this file if this file doesn't exist. The other thing it's going to do if this file exists, it's going to get rid of all the existing content. If I want to add data to an existing content, I want to open the file for append. So you just put in the file identifier, which is the file name, and then why you want to open it. So let's take a look at how to read. You storing what you read from a file is the purpose of read. We read file. Now this is after we have opened the file. You're going to read the file, the file name, and then where what variable you want to store it in. To see if there are more lines left in a file, we use EOF, and this stands for end of file. So we have EOF, which stands for end of file, followed by the file identifier, which is the name of the file. To write to data to a file, we use write file instead of read file. We open it up, we make sure it's opened for write, we write file, the name of the file, and then the data we want to write to. Now this says data. It could be data, could also be a variable. When you are done, make sure you close the file. If you do not close the file, all the contents disappear. If you've ever played any game, it'll say, please do not turn off while a game is saving. That's because the file is open. And if you don't close that file, that file becomes corrupted because it did not close properly. To close the file, one word, close file, and then the name of the file. Now, here's all together, throwing in an example, but not using in the file. So, loading the character's name for a game. We open the file, gamesave.txt for read. I want to read that file. So I'm going to read the file, gamesave.txt, and I'm going to take the information and I'm going to put it inside the variable username. I'm going to output username, because I've stored the data inside the variable username. I'm going to close the file, gamesave.txt. TXT, I close the file, it'll be there when I want to use it again next time. Now, all together, an example within the file. So, say I want to copy contents from one file to a new existing file. So I'm going to open the file, usernames.txt for read. I also want to open a file called new usernames.txt for write, because I want to write to a new existing file. So, uh, I declare new username is string, I declare existing names as of data type string because I need to take the existing name, store it, and then write to the new username. So while I'm not at the end of file, for what file? Usernames.txt. I'm going to read the file usernames.txt. I'm going to take that first line of text and I'm going to put it inside the variable line of text. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write to the file 
New usernames.txt, what am I writing there? Whatever was stored in line of text. And because both of these are open and I have selected what mode I want, I'm allowed to do this. And then end while. Once I reach the end of file, I can exit that loop. And there is one more important thing to do. I need to close those files. Otherwise, I just lost all the existing usernames. They're gone. And then I wasn't able to save my new username. That's a major, major issue. So we can simply do that with just a couple seconds of work. I close file usernames.txt. I close my file new usernames.txt. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to help our channel grow. And we'll see you guys in the next video.